Hello, good morning. I'm Ashok Kurokade, consultant rhinologist and anteriorscular surgeon from Winchester and uh, University Hospital, Southampton, UK. I welcome colleagues from around the world on behalf of organizing team to the second day of inaugural winter global rhinology and skull base surgery webathon. Global Rhinology Network is a non-profit organization with a mission to foster surgical education in rhinology and skull base surgery. We have successfully hosted annual multi-center live surgical webcast, The Lioness, since 2014 in collaboration with Lion Foundation. Thousands of surgeons from all corners of the world have benefited from it. More than 2,000 surgeons from 110 countries have registered for GRACE 2020. We had hugely informative and engaging 15 sessions on endoscopic sinus surgery presented by eminent rhinologists and skull base surgeons on day one. We'll be having similar sessions today focused on anterior skull base surgery. This event is hosted at the Global Telemedicine Studio of Professor Wilco Grohlmann in Utrecht, the Netherlands. It is supported by Medtronic and Carl Stoss. Imagine, what if you could do even more to bring relief to your chronic rhinosinusitis patients with technology customized to your unique clinical and facility needs? Introducing Stealth Station Flex ENT Navigation System, a customizable system from Medtronic ENT, a market leader in image-guided surgery technology. Featuring six hardware configurations, an optional portable card, two different electromagnetic emitter options, with flexibility in hardware design and optional software functionality. Get everything you need and nothing you don't with Stealth Station Flex ENT. Let's flex forward. Contact your Medtronic representative to customize a navigation solution that's right for you. Welcome, uh, Daniel. Uh, it's a privilege to have you on board here. So uh, I'm going to invite uh, Christos to host you today. So Christos, over to you. Thank you. Unmute. Yes. Danny, nice to see you. It's great to see you. We nice missed you in uh, September. Well, let's be more formal. Uh, Professor Prevedelo, of course, is one of the most uh, well-known, uh, uh, one of the premier endoscopic uh, skull-based neurosurgeons, neurosurgeons in the world and with a long career originating in Brazil uh, where he did his medical degree and then his uh, basic residency and then he went to the US where he got his specialization. Uh, he developed his, of course, his reputation and nowadays he's well known for his work in a variety of areas, but most importantly, endoscopic skull-based uh, surgery. And we are always happy to to host him in our uh, skull base course in Leiden and we missed him uh, this year. So hopefully next year we'll be enjoying some beers in, uh, in Leiden, hopefully, if we can make it. So uh, he, gave, uh, he has given a number of talks also with us and this time he will be talking about the skull base meningiomas. Um, I think always in, in our course, his lectures are probably the, one of the most well received. So I'm, we're looking forward uh, to another great lecture. Well, should I go ahead, uh, Shok? Yes, please. So uh, really, thanks uh, for the invitation. Uh, really an honor to, to be here and participate. I think in the past with the uh, lioness, we did some uh, live surgery 
and this is I think first time we're you know sharing uh, some lectures and uh, with all this going on in the world I think it's a uh, it's an honor to be here you know hopefully like you were mentioned earlier we'll, we'll get together to really because the best part is always what comes after the lectures right uh, when we get together and spend time together and uh, so we'll, that's the main thing we're missing these days so uh, so really, thanks uh, for the invitation. I'll, I'll share here my screen. Let's see. And um, so today I'm gonna talk about the, uh, the role of the endoscopic uh, surgery for the treatment of meningiomas. And my understanding, I have around 30 minutes, right, Ashok? Um, so um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, yes. I'll try to uh, condense this in 30 minutes. So I'm gonna do, I cannot speak as fast as, as Dr. Janakiram, but I'm gonna try to, uh, expedite here as well. So when we come into nasal for the treatment of uh, meningiomas, we, we follow the principles of scope-based surgery where we decrease the retraction on the brain. So we basically come with a low angle and we're able to access the entire scope base, not only anterior fossa, but middle fossa and posterior fossa. And we're gonna show some of the examples. I'm gonna start today talking about anterior fossa, then we go to posterior fossa and then go to middle fossa. So in terms of principle, we basically connect all the uh, sinuses to create one cavity to be able to work uh, through the sinonasal cavity. Um, always with bimanual dissection. So we need two surgeons to be able to do that. So we have uh, one surgeon with the endoscope and one instrument and the other surgeon with uh, two hands, usually a suction and a drill, a suction and a dissector or a C or scissors. How is it really a teamwork? The dynamic view is essential uh, to do this work, to be able to have what I call the uh, virtual 3D. By moving the camera, you can have uh, the virtual, virtual 3D understanding of the, uh, the structures. And for many jomas, for instance, of the anterior scope base, when we approach with the endoscope and the nasal like this, we convert a scope base tumor in a convexed tumor. I think I really believe on that because we follow the same principles. We remove the mucosa, we debulk the tumor, devascularize the tumor, and then we perform a, a dissection of the, of the surrounding extra capsular dissection of the tumor away from the brain. And for small tumors, we can actually get a Simpson 1, which is for the ENTs on the audience, a Simpson 1 means basically a complete resection, or even the dura where the tumor was implanted is removed with it. So that's called the Simpson 1, which is always the goal in meningioma surgery. Uh, sometimes not possible, but uh, uh, when you come with a craniotomy in a tumor like this, very, very common the surgeon just bipolar the dura at the end, and that's not a Simpson one, that will be a two or three, which is, has higher incidence of recurrence. So again, with the endonasal, you can drill the bone and you can remove that dura, and then you do the reconstruction with a nasal septal flap uh, for the most part there to avoid the CSF leak and uh, reconstruct the skull base. So basically that's uh, the overview. And uh, recently, uh, uh, Dr. McGill here and the group from uh, Italy and uh, UCSF, they published a classification that I, I liked a lot. Um, and it basically the, the tumor can uh, have scores and goes all the way to six if you have like a large tumor that invades the canal for tuberculum cell meningiomas and, and, and surrounds the artery, you have a six. If, and then it, it will be a five if it's a large one that doesn't really uh, surround the arteries. Uh, Dr. McGill is uh, my fellow uh, this year, so we're honored to have him uh, with us for, the, for this uh, year. And, um, and he's going to um, Northwestern in uh, Chicago next. So we're very proud of uh, working with him, very happy with uh, his work. And when we look at most of our tumors, we, we went back and this is gonna be published uh, like most of our tumors score like a four, five, or six actually. And that doesn't, in, like it's not for like a prohibitive to do endonasal surgery for these high scores ones. Um, the, there's some aspects that I looked in order to indicate surgery. And the main one is the spill of tumor on top of the optic canal or going beyond the optic canal. That would be my actually limitation that I say, no, this cannot be done. Surrounding the, uh, the vessels, it's, Daniel, it definitely makes more you. difficult. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I think the presentation yeah. is probably not uh, moving further. It's frozen, uh, the slides. Where, where are you seeing that? Let me stop sharing and share again then. Yes, please. Because for me, it was, uh, was no problem there. Do you see here? Yeah, we can see this one now. Okay. Thank you. 
Yeah, so the yeah, please let me know if it happens again because I I don't I never had that happening. Sure. The so you can see here the invasion of the optic canal is not an issue and the surrounding of the vessels is definitely not an issue as well. It's definitely make more difficult. Um, but but um, this is like the post-op. Uh, most of the time in a post-op, what we want to see, make sure that the flap is in place and the pituitary stock still enhancing with the pituitary gland enhancing. That's the ideal uh, type of picture for post-op. Uh, very important to remember the superior hypophyseal arteries in meningioma of the supracellar area because the superior hypophyseal arteries give blood supply to the cisternal segment of the optic nerve and part of the gland as well. Uh, so these are just examples of, uh, of some of these uh, tuberculum cell meningiomas that we've done. These are the only early ones in my career. Uh, we've done, I think, more than 50 of these now. And you can see how, how it, it looks like uh, post-op, you know, like we always have the MRI showing the, the pituitary gland there. And if you look at the sagittal, you'll see the, the, the flap in place uh, for reconstruction after the cases. Um, one thing that we've been using uh, these days is the utilization of, of um, ICG uh, fluorescence. It helps you to define the position of the carotids. If it's, you know, if sometimes you, you don't know what it is, if it, the, the, the sphenoid is not very well pneumatized, that helps us to see where the carotids are and also to take some of the uh, blood supply as well at the dura. And at the end of the case, you can run it again because of this, these tumors, they do fluoresce as well. So this is a small one that was coming just the undersurface of the left optic nerve that was a uh, patient was losing vision. So here you can see uh, when the, the tumor enhances and then at the end of the case, you can run it again and you can see um, the uh, vascular uh, blood supply, you know, the, the, if there's any residual and you can then um, have a, a, a good control and understanding of the, your post-op picture. So you can see superior hypophysial preserved the carotid there, and that's the optic nerve. So those are things that, uh, that can be done as well. Um, in order to open the uh, optic canal, I use a, uh, a knife that we designed, and also you can use these daisy scissors that you can cut backwards. This is opening the canal, and you can decompress the optic canal completely and remove the tumor that is medial and at least 180 around the optic nerve. You cannot go lateral to the optic nerve with this opening. So the thing is that tuberculum cell meningiomas invade the optic canal from the medial aspect. So uh, you can do this and, and resect that component of the tumor. For, for the most part, you can get a complete resection using this technique. When the tumors get larger, that's when I started in my career thinking about staging some of these tumors. This lady was in her late 40s and basically functionally blind with this tumor that was surrounding the middle cerebral artery there. Uh, so for these ones, touching the basilar, surround, I thought that this would be impossible to resect uh, with uh, endonasal, but I felt that if I did a craniotomy, there was a high chance of making more damage in her optic nerves. So I came endonasal and um, we were able actually to roll the tumor away from the, from the bifurcation there and um, let me just go back here for a second. And um, you can see here the, the end of the surgery where the bifurcation was like a, preserved there. You can see the uh, anterior cerebral arteries through transparency because the optic nerve got so thinned up, but we didn't touch it. That's the beauty here. And with a good approach and good exposure, we're actually able to remove that tumor completely. And uh, you can see the uh, anterior cerebral artery going on top of the optic there and the middle cerebral artery there, the stock preserved carotid artery there. So with this, we got a complete resection uh, and no deterioration of vision. Her vision improved, but not tremendously. I think over the years, I noticed that optic nerve uh, after compression of very dense tumors like fibrous tumors, meningiomas, they are less likely to have an impressive improvement like we see in, uh, in optic damage caused by uh, uh, adenomas. Adenomas, I think they're soft and they, they cause less damage. I think um, the way I think this happens is really like pressure by having the anterior cerebral artery on the other side. Um, I noticed over the years, if the anterior cerebral artery is very large, there's less damage to the nerve than if it's very small, because the smaller the, the artery, you have a higher pressure because of uh, of the physics there. And then I think there's more damage uh, when you have a small anterior cerebral artery against a meningioma that is in the uh, supracellar space. Here's the reconstruction, the, uh, the enhancement of the gland, and that's what you wanna see. 
So I'm going to bring some examples of uh, when I did not do endonasal surgery. So like here is an example of when we look at this MRI carefully, the optic nerve was in the medial aspect of the nerve and the nerve was entering, if you look at the coronal down here, it was entering the canal from the top and spilling to the other side as well. So for this one, I decided to do an eyebrow approach through the left here and got a complete resection of that tumor uh, for the patient. I see here the post-op, that patient did very well. And I think this is very important that uh, you have to look at case by case. It's not because it's supracellar and small, you just jump with endonasal. I, I, like again, it was pushing the optic nerve down, so I didn't want to damage that, that nerve. Here's another example of the case that was early uh, during the COVID when we were, this was in April, and I, we were all worried about going endonasal, so that contributed for my decision to do an uh, open approach. But this was a case that was already surrounding the interior cerebral arteries. And if you look at the coronal, it was spilling beyond the optic nerve. The optic nerve is this darker area here. The white area here that looks like the, the optic canal is actually invasive tumor in the lateral aspect of the canal. So for me, this was a, a no-brainer like uh, to do only one, case, one surgery here. We did a craniotomy with a small frontal orbital temporal that I call, or a lat frontal, frontal lateral approach. And we got a complete resection for this patient with an open approach. You know, and we were able to open and get the canal open from the top. Um, the other consideration we have to have for anterior skull-based meningiomas is a, a smell, olfaction. And here you see a patient that lost the smell already and the disease is not going beyond and is not surrounding the anterior cerebral arteries. This is not a tuberculum cell, it's more like a planum uh, meningioma with a component in the olfactory groove with edema on the left. So for these, uh, these cases here, um, you probably could go uh, open, but I, I have a tendency to go with endonasal approaches for this due to uh, the last manipulation of the frontal lobe. So this is what we did. We came into nasal, you can see the flap there is because the tumor was not going too lateral. And uh, if, if the smell is already gone, uh, that's our decision on these cases. And we published a couple of papers in the literature showing that the amount of flare changes you have in the brain after coming through the nose is much less than when we come uh, with an open approach, uh, probably like a, like a footprint that uh, open approach can leave it there. Some situations like this, you see this gentleman came to me from another state with uh, this tumor that you can see, is spell, it goes much beyond the optic canals. Uh, not very big, the smell is still there and edema here on the, uh, on the left side. So in this case, no question here, uh, in order to get a complete resection, we came with a contralateral eyebrow incision, subfrontal approach, and we resect this, uh, completely here for this patient. You can see this is the post-op and uh, coming with, a, with an eyebrow approach. Um, and his smell was preserved with that approach. So that was the right decision, quality of life. He is very happy with the results. We're just, has been more than five years now and no recurrence. Sometimes you see uh, large tumors like this. And, um, and this is a patient that came to Ohio State University 10 years before me. And another surgeon that is not at Ohio State decided to do a bicoronal, bifrontal, and resect this tumor. Um, there was some edema, as you can see here. And after the surgery, uh, this is the result. You can see there is a, a little more of encephalomalacia, but not too bad, no stroke. You did a good job. But if you look here, there is still hyperostosis at the skull base. And this patient, unfortunately, lost follow-up and came to me 10 years later. A uh, patient was under the understanding that was cured by the benign disease. And you can see here, it recurred badly with a lot of olfactory groove and plantar sphenoidale meningioma and another component of the tuberculum. She was losing vision uh, with this disease. You can see this, the, the opening that was done before here. So no question here, I came in donaso because you know, this is a lot of scar on the frontal area. There's, and the problem is really at the skull base. So we came in donaso, resect out that tumor, her vision went back to normal and, uh, and she's doing very well. Um, of course, we're not able to get that, uh, you know, sagittal meningioma there that we were observing over the years that has never grown. So with this concept uh, of the, the fact that these approaches can be complementary, I, I started for diseases like this where you have a lot of hyperostosis and the tumor goes lateral. I started to do this in stages because if I go endonasal only, I cannot cure this patient. There, there's no way I can go all the way that lateral there. 
If I do craniotomy only, it's a big surgery. I need to drill all this down. I'm going to retract some brain. Uh, the tumor will be vascular, as you can see. It's going to be a big surgery, fighting the brain. So the, my philosophy for these tumors that, that go on both, uh, both territories here, I do an endoscopic endonasal, drill as much as the hyperostosis, even lateral on top of the orbits. I remove and bipolar and take the anterior and posterior tumoidal arteries. And I make a hole on the tumor after that. The tumor collapses down, and it looks like this. This is, uh, this is just post-op a few days later. So I wait uh, three months, the edema goes away, and now I have a much smaller problem. It's a devascularized tumor. I just need to clean that second floor. So I, I do a small opening on the side. I don't need to do bicoronal, take the bar of the orbits, nothing like that. Small, small approach. And you can actually get a, what a close, the closest it gets to a, a Simpson one on these patients. And the flap, I put it at the end of the first stage there. The key on this case is if I go back here, is not to try to remove. You don't want to go in the interface between brain and tumor. You want to leave that alone for the dissection on the second stage. Otherwise, you create scar there. So like a tumor like this, this is exactly what I would do. You see it goes beyond here on the right side. So for these, I did a debulking initially. And then, um, and then we, came, we came back with the second stage. And you can see that the second stage, this is through the craniotomy. You see the optic nerve. There's no need of a retraction. The brain is not angry, it's not coming out, and you can then uh, resect the rest of the meningioma like we normally do here. No much time to show the, the videos, but um, you can see here the, uh, that we will peel that from the brain. You can see I use a lot of like a cotonoids, plagets, but no need for uh, big retraction on these cases because the tumor was already devascularized. There's not a lot of edema. The brain is relaxed. It has been three months since the decompression. And then you can take these tumors out like uh, uh, coming from the second floor, like I call, after being working below. So you can see the optic canal, make sure that there's, there's no tumor there. This was really originated from the interscope, so it's not entering the canal. And you can see the flap from the top and, uh, and get a complete resection for these patients. So now I'm gonna move from uh, the anterior fossa to the posterior fossa. Um, I'm gonna start in the cell and go down. So the, one of the most difficult meningiomas in, in the skull base is actually the dorsum cell meningioma. It is not a tuberculum cell, it's actually centered on the, on the posterior part of the gland here. The pituitary stalk is usually pushed forward and really blocks any uh, craniotomy approach. See anterior cerebral artery and the optic nerves are here. You cannot really work through this corridor. The stalk is down in front of you. You can work with a craniotomy in between the carotid and the optic nerve, but you just see part of the tumor is definitely very difficult. So this uh, understanding that my partner decided to come with a, endosco sorry, with a microscopic transphenoidal approach and uh, start working there. And this is the view, of, you see the speculum here. This is a view of the microscope of the cella. He did an extended approach by removing some of the tuberculum. And this is the view of the microscope. See, the stock was pushed forward. Um, he entered uh, the tumor by working on each side of the uh, stock. And you can see the debulking of the tumor. He's working there. Um, and then uh, he basically, in one point, noticed the limitation of the approach. He couldn't really reach the dorsum cella area. So at this point, about 4 p.m., it calls me. Uh, hey, Danny, can you give a hand with the endoscope here to get, get it going? And I tried to put the endoscope first uh, through this through the speculum, but it's very limited. You basically fight the angles and cannot do that. So we had to take the speculum, create an isoceptal flap. I called Corral. Corral did a flap for us. And, um, and then I was able to uh, move. This is now the same case, endoscopic visualization. You see the dorsum cell. I, I did a hemitransposition where I removed the uh, connection of the pituitary gland on the left side. And then we worked uh, above and below. This is like um, when it start working, some of the tumors are already debulked. You see the blood there. Uh, and I disconnect to see this is the carotid uh, here on the left side. I don't, I don't need to remove much, but you do need to expose the medial part of the face of the cavernous sinus. And I disconnected here. This is what we call the hemitransposition of the pituitary gland. Uh, it's been more than 10 years that I've been doing that. And here is like, uh, you see that uh, uh, posterior clinoid there. And then you remove the posterior clinoid and then you can work basically through this corridor uh, using uh, the gland that you move up there. 
Here you see the basilar artery, and then now you can really work on that implant. You remove the dorsum cellae, and you can actually resect that tumor. We removed that tumor completely, and you see the stalk still beautifully attached uh, there. The optic nerve is preserved on the top, and the gland looks fine, and this is the way it looks like after the disconnection here. Then I put a collagen matrix all the way around and uh, covered with the nasoceptal flap. You can see how you, the gland stays in the way, but you can mobilize. You can mobilize and make sure you get a complete resection. And uh, I just did another hemitransposition last week. Uh, so this is the way we do that. This is the way it looks like in the MRI afterwards. You see the collagen matrix and the flap covering here. She didn't have any, uh, any um, uh, CSF leakage, but she did have a, tr a, a transient diabetes insipidus. Uh, she does have a, a, a touch of a permanent diabetes insipidus that she takes half a tablet at night to go through the night fine. During the day, she doesn't take any. So it's very, very mild uh, DI that is permanent. And the rest of pituitary gland is normal and she and her vision completely went back to normal. So going down a little more of the meningiomas, you have meningiomas that go down. If they're medial to the sixth nerve with the main component behind the clivus, I prefer to go endonasal. This is an example of a tumor that was watching and it was growing. And you can see here the view, this is an old video. But I love it because it shows the fact that we are removing the last piece of meningioma from the medial aspect of the sixth nerve here after uh, removing that tumor that was in the retroclival area. Um, and uh, here's another one that we did recently. Uh, this is a, a patient sorry, here that had this tumor growing. And we did a, we did a trans through, through the clivus as well. Let me just advance here. We did a, um, a transcavernous transposition by basically just cutting the part of the periosteum, not a complete transposition in this case, but enough for us to uh, get that uh, bone that was behind the carotid with the posterior clinoid here. And you can see the uh, branch of the, um, of the descending here, um, um, dorsum uh, meningeal there, uh, we dissected. And see, there is a vessel branch of the carotid there. This is right attached to the uh, posterior cline right there. So we kind of spend a little time, but we're able to get it off. You can see the curvature of the carotid that was seating right there. And then we, we were able to uh, take that out and then open the dura. And I'll show you here where we, we were able to get this. Uh, it's like a small uh, petroclival meningioma. Uh, this basically was in between the third nerve and the sixth nerve. So I found the, saw the basilar down there. And then as we moved uh, here, I was able to see the third nerve superiorly, dissect the arachnoid, and the sixth nerve was just inferior. So the, we, once we saw both cranial nerves, the third was up there, as you can see a little glimpse. And it's interesting because it was really in between the two nerves. Uh, so then we were able to then go lateral with this maneuver here because we knew the sixth nerve was just under and de detach that a little more like side in implantation of the tumor uh, behind the carotid and the petroclival area. And then once we disconnected, we got that whole tumor came out actually in one piece. And this patient uh, did not have any complication, no CSF leak and no sixth nerve pause, no third nerve pause. You see the sixth nerve is right down here, uh, still connected beautifully there. So then we inspect with the angle scopes, make sure that was all clean, and then we do this reconstruction. This is the way of doing these days. This patient did not have a leak, it's the gasket, uh, we call it the soft gasket, where we put a collagen matrix. And so a lot of the people here at ENTs, let me go back. Uh, this is uh, my contribution for the reconstruction. This is collagen matrix, with more collagen matrix and gel foam in the center, followed by fat, and then followed by the uh, nasoceptal flap. And this patient didn't leak with the clival defect. You can see here, like, looks very good. Um, some other examples, this is a patient that had a, a, a petroclival as well. In this case, there was a lot of tumor lateral to the sixth nerve. So once we found the sixth nerve during surgery, we actually stopped and we left this disease between the sixth and the seventh nerve there. And uh, we watched that over the years. This is four years later. Day five, I thought that was compressing the brain stem a little bit. So we came back with a retrosig and we complement that, like, uh, that uh, resection with the retrosig approach. And this patient is neurologically intact um, with the petroclival under control there. There was a little, little bit of tumor uh, in the, where the sixth nerve was with scar around that I gave gamma knife and, uh, and she's doing very well. 
If the tumor is in the petrous surface, then we uh, we don't we don't come uh, with the endonasal because there's doesn't make sense. If more of the tumor is touching the petrous, I do a retrosigmoid like this one or anterior petrosectomy, depending on the case. This one we did a retrosig because you see here there's a little contact with the with the clival surface, but most of the tumor is in the petrous area, so we come retrosig on these cases. Um, how much time we have uh, still, uh, Dr. Roque? I just have a couple more uh, cases uh, to show. Uh, please so interrupt we me. We can probably go for uh, another uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Oh, okay, so then we can, we can finalize then. I'll, I'll, I will slow down and show these cases then. So here's, you, you see a, a, a meningioma of the foramen magnum. So for the foramen magnum, it's very uh, important to have two concepts. Uh, it has to be medial to the vertebral arteries uh, for you to uh, indicate an endonasal approach because the 12 cranial nerves run lateral to the, to the vertebral arteries there. And the other concept is really like this, uh, how low it goes. If it is for a magnum meningioma like this one that is mainly implanted in the dura behind the clivus and doesn't go below this line uh, from C1 and C2, uh, that, then I can come in the nasal. I know the only ligament I'm going to compromise is the apical ligament, so then I can take that out. If the tumor implants behind C2, those are cases that I'm going to come with an open approach, lateral um, uh, indications, and, and not in the nasal. So here you can see this case is during the surgery. This is the, the view here during surgery, beautiful view of the, basal, the, the, the vertebral artery, C12 nerve posteriorly, pica coming out of, the, of this, the vertebral artery on the left here. And this is uh, taking the tumor at the very end after debulking. And basically, we debulked and, and, and rolled this uh, from, uh, from inside out. And um, it was a great uh, uh, complete resection we got for this patient. You can see uh, it's almost like a disconnected at this point. And then uh, we were able to roll it out completely and make sure that that completely resected there. You can see this is the last piece uh, of, of the tumor. And, um, and you can see the, the, the complete resection here. That's the final view. It, it, it looks like beautiful, um, you know, like just taking a little bit of the blood that accumulated in the cistern, but you see on the 12 on both sides. And, and basically, we're able to remove that tumor without touching those structures. If you came with a far lateral approach, definitely will be a lot of manipulation of the inferior cranial nerves and the 12 cranial nerves to reach this very ventral tumor. So this endonasal really helps for this very ventral uh, uh, clival meningiomas and foramen magnum meningiomas there. This patient did have a CSF leak or pneumocephalus, a lot of confusion. Uh, we came back. This reconstruction was not done with... Uh, with fat, we only had the collagen matrix and, and the flap, and we augment the reconstruction with the fat graft, and, and he did great. This is immediately after surgery, and this is like um, eight years later. Look at that, like no recurrence. This is the, the vertebral arteries there that you saw in the picture, vertebral artery, vertebral artery, no, no uh, recurrence there. Um, so this is another one that is interesting because this is a small tumor that we were watching but it grew very fast. I don't have the previous pictures here. The patient only had some dizziness, some, some weird sensation, a pain in the neck, uh, and the, you know, the tumor progressed. It was bigger in six months, so we decided to take it out. It's very low, and we need to do a middle condylectomy to get there. You see, this is the upper part of the condyle, and this is where this, the, the 12 cranial nerve is coming out. So on this case, uh, we decided to do what we call the focal uh, uh, focal endonasal approach here. Uh, let me uh, show you. We didn't open the sphenoid. We decided to do a flap of the uh, uh, sinonasal, um, uh, the nasopharynx, basically. So here's the posterior septectomy, creating that flap. And this I did with Dr. Otto, uh, my other uh, ENT partner, Brad Otto. And he, he basically created, this is the, nas the upper part of Koana, if you see here. So that's the, and he rolled this nice flap down. And this was actually the only vascularized reconstruction that we use in this case. It was, it, it worked very well. There was no leakage here. Um, and basically went all the way down to the bone and rolled, we rolled that down until we were able to expose the, um, the left side, as you can see here, uh, condyle. So that, that's down to the condyle, very focal uh, approach. You, the articularis is down there. So I basically drilled the clivus and, um, and the medial aspect of the condyle. This is on the left side. 
And let me fast, uh, fast forward uh, a little bit here, just a sec. So we were able to then open the Dura on this case. And you can see here, um, once we open the Dura, we can see this, the 12 kernel nerve running just uh, lateral to the, the tumor there. And I, for this case, we debulked with, um, with the instruments here. This is the aspirator cutter device. And I cut all these, was able to go around. Um, this is a, a bipolar aquamantis. And then, and then we were able to kind of remove the insertion. I used this uh, knife to go around and disconnected, devascularized. And in one moment, we were able to then roll that tumor out. And you can see that we got it out with a very focal approach directly there to the condyle without open the sphenoid. And uh, I used this um, angle uh, curette with a 90 degrees to make sure that I scratch it all the way, uh, all that dura. Um, and then we put a collagen matrix, really focal where the tumor was. And I do that same technique where they call the soft gasket. I put it, see the dura around the dura. So it kind of passes beyond. And then um, in the center, then I put more uh, gel foam and, and sometimes more pieces of uh, collagen matrix as well. And in this case, because it's deep there, we actually covered this with a piece of fat. Um, and then to basically get the dead space of that area. But you can see how basically gel foam uh, dilates afterwards and pushes the wall. And then um, with a little bit of fat on the way there to seal, then we rolled that nasal, um, nasal pharynx flap up. And if you look at the end here, it looks like we're never there. Looks really good. We're very happy with this result. And uh, no leak, no deficits, and a complete resection. This has been, what, three or four years, and there's uh, no recurrence as well. Uh, if the tumor goes up beyond the, uh, uh, the vertebral arches, as you can see here, and invade part of the jugular foramen, that's when we prefer to come laterally here. Um, this is a far lateral incision that we use. It's called the, uh, the S incision. And here is the uh, resection after that. Just a few more cases to finalize. Uh, some of the principles. If you look at this meningioma, it's completely behind the odontoid. In this case, we will not come endonasal because I would de basically destabilize the patient. It will need a fusion afterwards. Plus, in this case, the, ver the, the, the spinal cord was actually pushed kind of forward in an angle here. So I came with a midline approach for this patient because I thought I would have access to the tumor. And, th and this patient was 78. And um, interestingly, when we got there, this is a microscopic view coming from behind with a, with a laminectomy of C1 and C2. This whole surgery took 18 minutes from dura to dura here. There was no need for dissection. The spinal cord was pushed forward. See the vert down there and some of this rootless there and the implantation of the tumor was just a small area here at the, the cervical dura. So really have to look at case by case. It's not, it's not that you know, you can do Indonesia, you're gonna push Indonesia. This is an example that we did open approach and this is post-op, patient did very well. So now just to finalize the, com the, the concept of uh, carbonosinus meningiomas, I did not invent this. This is uh, first described in the literature by Dr. Faubusch uh, from Germany. And he described a transphenoidal decompression by removing bone uh, of the medial aspect of the carbonosinus. And he described a beautiful paper with improvement of a lot of uh, cranial nerve deficits. And this is like, we do this endonasal endoscopically. He did a lot of more with the microscope. And uh, we just got to publish the series in uh, Frontiers Neurology. And uh, you can see here how we do it. We basically drill out, uh, and I'm going to advance here just for the time. Uh, we remove all the bone medial to the carotid artery. See here, the cell is right there. And this is the cavernous sinus. We are removing the bone. We make it very thin. And this is something we learned from, from Dr. Kassam. He's, uh, he always did that way, uh, really uh, thin out there. The other advantage of coming in is that you can biopsy. I go in between the two layers of dura and the cella. You can open that and you can actually get tissue and you can biopsy that. And then you know what type of meningioma you're dealing with. See, see this is the internal layer covering the gland. And this is the sternal here. So that's perios periosteum and meningeal layer. And the meningiomas grows in between. And it can transfer actually cells grow from one side to the other. So there's, I have a couple of patients that actually over time in, in years recurred on the other side. And you know why now. 
because that's the way they travel. With Doppler here, see the carotid there, and you can also open a V2 level. See here, we open a V2. So you can open a cell, you can open a V2. If there's more a suckable type of thing, you can actually debulk. Most of the time it's very fibrous and then it's not worth it. And then I cover with the flap or with a graft. And this is how it looks like. The medial wall is completely removed on these uh, patients. And we have uh, an algorithm that we publish where if there's no symptoms, we observe, but if they, there's double vision, we go for decompression and biopsy. If there is a large component lateral in the cavernous sinus, I combine with the craniotomy to take that component lateral and just leave disease in the cavernous sinus, then you can give radiation to that. Um, if it recurs, I have a couple patients in my career, then I do a radical resection, and at that point, you're not, not trying to preserve function. I call this concept for the cavernous sinus meningioma, a uh, functional scope based surgery because we're trying to keep improve the function for the patient and not really treat the uh, the uh, disease itself other than using radiation for that. Main advantage is that you get pathology. You know, for for the most part, you know uh, BKI sixty seven. Then you can actually apply radiation uh, properly for these patients. Uh, most patients improve vision. What, what we discover in our series is that patients that had a long time of uh, double vision, those are the ones that didn't get better. Uh, have a patient with a six nerve palsy for eight years, we decompressed, nothing had happened. She still had the double vision. We had to kind of send her for the ophthalmologist to correct that. Uh, of course, if the meningiomas are in the middle fossa, not related to the cavernous sinus, then we will do a uh, middle fossa approach with a peeling there and, and get an open approach that's obvious. And we have a couple patients that we did a combine at the same time. So this is an example of, um, of a, a high-grade meningioma or low sarcoma grade here uh, that you, we came open. This is an endoscopic coming open. This is the dura here. This is V3. And here's the spatula because we have a craniotomy going on. But we have an endoscopic kind of sternum and now an endoscopic transphenoidal here. This is a, a V2 area, V3. So this is the lateral recess of the sphenoid open. And you can see here the surgeon on the outside there and we're connecting the dots, cleaning the tumor. This is at the end of the resection when we're having some fun there, making sure that the whole tumor is resected for this patient. Um, and that's just showing that sometimes we will do that combined approach. That was Dr. Otto on the other side there. So uh, to finalize, I'd like to invite everybody uh, to our uh, virtual symposium for the NSBS that we're helping to uh, organize. Unfortunately, we're not doing that full meeting. We're gonna be a virtual just one day on February 13th. And I invite everybody uh, to participate. Uh, thanks so much. Stealth Station ENT, the advanced image guidance system for the full range of navigated ENT procedures. Engineered with you in mind, based on decades of scientific, clinical, and engineering expertise. We're expanding what was previously possible with image-guided surgery. Flexible and elegantly designed, Stealth Station ENT streamlines the workflow so you can maintain focus. The flat, under-the-head emitter allows for an efficient setup. Its design allows for a large EM field. Easily find your patient's exam through a variety of network options, super speed USB or optical disc. The visualization and modeling features give you the perspective you need. Leverage data from multiple sources to create high resolution 3D images. View structures and pathology with high fidelity. Registration expertly matches the three-dimensional positioning of the patient with the preoperative images used for navigation. Patient registration combines registration methods and provides numerical and visual accuracy feedback. Leverage the latest technology for advanced surgeries. See more. Do more. The result? You have an image-guided perspective like never before. With Stealth Station ENT, you're at the forefront of ENT surgery. You are Stealth. Thank you very much, Sidan. That was a great 
presentation, as, as always. Um, let's see. We have some uh, questions. There is, uh, okay, there are two questions from the audience. Uh, one is the, specifically asking about uh, optic nerve sheath meningiomas. What is your experience with optic nerve sheath meningiomas? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, and you notice that I didn't talk much about it because we don't have a good solution for that. That's the reality. Um, so I, I open the canal on these cases. I make diagnosis, um, decompress the optic canal. But as the tumor follows the optic nerve sheet all the way to the eyeball, all the way to the globe, uh, the literature shows if you try to open that, uh, you basically you cause a lot of problems. You can cause third nerve palsies with uh, damaging the branches, and you can cause blindness as well by, uh, you know, for the central retina, artery, uh, volsion, things like that. So f basically in our practice, I, uh, I give radiation to the rest of the optic canal uh, involvement if, if there is one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And um, another question is, uh, what percentage of your meningioma patients required uh, or had radiotherapy after uh, post-surgery? So, so my philosophy is like, I don't know the number precisely, but uh, if it is a grade one and there is residual uh, in some areas, I, I usually watch it. I usually watch that, that residual for grade one. Uh, if, it, if the residue is in the cavernous sinus where, for instance, an area that I don't want to ever go back, I do radiation right away, even if it's grade one. So cavernous sinus, meningiomas of the jugular foramen and superior sagittal sinus, uh, the residues in those areas, I tend to give radiation earlier, even if it's grade one. If it is a grade two uh, and I have a complete resection, I still watch it because the MRI is clean, I watch it, and that's controversial. A lot of people give radiation to the tumor bed in grade twos. If there's any residual in grade two, I give radiation. In grade threes, radiation for sure. And usually grade threes are patients that already had radiation. Usually grade three is actually atrogenic. Uh, I think there's literature now coming from uh, Brigham Women that shows that the patients with grade threes and the mutations to that level are usually patients that already receive radiation. So it's probably we physicians caused that grade three to happen. Yeah, unfortunately. So I think it's more and more solid. So if you can avoid radiation, bottom line is better because you may induce one on grade three in the future. Of course, that's a very small possibility, but something to have in mind. Thanks, that's a very complete answer. Um, now I see that we have uh, Professor James Palmer. I will leave a uh, hi. Thanks. How are you, Jim? Eddie, excellent lecture. Thank you so much. Yeah, I love every time I get to see your lecture. Yeah. Something new I learn. One quick question, yeah. though, if you if you don't mind. Please, yeah. Um, so are really big um, pituitaries that are probably too big to get entirely into nasal, you know, so you've got that low stuff and it comes up anterior and it doesn't down, it doesn't come down to you, and especially if it's gone fairly far laterally. We've run into an issue where if you don't get that entire pituitary, you have a risk of bleeding post-operative sure. before you For come sure. back and do it open. So unlike what you were showing, we've been going open first and, and, and doing the pituitary all the way down and then coming back endoscopically for yeah. anything else. So I'll tell you I'll, very quickly, I'll try to answer that because it's an excellent question. Um, so the... There are different diseases, so just quickly. Many joma, if you leave it behind for second stage, no problem. Okay. Uh, my theory, I'll tell you quickly my theory for the many, the adenomas, why that happens. It happens to most of the time, if when you leave a big chunk there, it will suffer apoplexy, like post-operative yeah. apoplexy disaster. It's because the pituitary adenomas, they drain, they receive blood supply, and they drain through the cavernous sinus. So when you come in the nasal, you remove the lower part of the tumor, there's no exit for the drainage of the tumor. So the tumor suffers venous infarct and it suffers this congestion that sometimes you don't see, it doesn't bleed, it just gets congested and if it goes okay, it finds its way. But if it gets congested and suffer a hemorrhagic transformation, then is exactly what you said. So I agree 100% for giant pituitary adenomas, it's better to do a craniotomy first if, it's, okay. if it is in the, in the arachnoid space 
and do the, the endonasal second to clean the job from below afterwards. I agree 100%. With the exception is, I had a couple of patients that I, I'm, I'm going to publish now. I actually have to double uh, to correct the paper the medical student just finished. <laughs> Dante, he's a good guy. Is to do an endonasal second floor technique, I call. So I go endonasal, and with this principle, I don't clean the cell at number one, like, like the traditional neurosurgery, pituitary surgery teaches us. Clean the floor and goes up. For these large ones, I actually open the planum first, go on the top, clean the cistern, and then I clean the cella through the nose. And I have a couple of examples I'm going to try to publish. Fascinating. Yeah. I always I learn something new every time you talk, Danny. So yeah. good to see you. Good I wish we were you. together. Ashok, you've got to get I us know. all together so we can lecture, learn from each other, and have our social time together too. Yeah, it's like yesterday, it's like yesterday that we were together while I was in Denmark, that we were together like 13 years ago or so. <laughs> it feels that way. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how many years, but it was great. Okay. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank